Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Bloomer. I'm the program manager for the Education and Research Center and the director for the uh, Center's Continuing Education Program as well. Um, and we are working with the Center for Closing the Health Gap today to present this webinar. Um, just a couple of things to go over before we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and I will send out that link to everyone afterwards. Um, please mute yourself when you're not speaking, uh, but feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, you just have to unmute or you can post them in the chat. Um, I will send out an event evaluation afterwards, um, so please complete that in order to receive a certificate. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker, Renee Mahaffey-Harris. Go ahead. Well, first of all, Jessica, I thank you for organizing and, and making this um, conversation today about um, the environmental factors impacting marginalized populations. Um, so I thank you for all of your help and um, getting this move from an in-person to a webinar so more people can participate. So um, I do plan for this to be interactive. So as I go through the slides, please feel free as, as, we, as I go through each slide for, to ask questions or share your thoughts and perspectives. Um, for those of you who don't know who the Center for Closing the Health Gap is, um, we are an 18-year-old community-based health organization that has been working to build a culture of health through our mission of leading the efforts to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities throughout greater Cincinnati through both advocacy, education, and community outreach. Our work is accomplished through our grassroots mobilization model, which we designed so that we can engage the very people and all of the stakeholders like many of you on the call today, as well as working to educate and empower individuals to be equipped with the tools to be a part of their own health solution so that they can then advocate for their own health, their own lives of themselves and their families, as well as advocate around the barriers that persist and are many of the reasons, such as our determinative factors, um, and some of the things that we will explore today as we really specifically focus on the environmental health. So the learning objectives for today include three. First, we, I hope to define the environmental factors that contribute to health disparities. I hope that we can lead to a conversation and understanding why disparities exist, and then better understand the health impact of environmental disparities and who is most impacted. So I thought we would begin by just kind of level setting on the conversation of health disparities um, and the social, environmental, and economic inequities that drive the disparities that we have seen over many decades and frankly centuries. From the economic stability to neighborhood and physical environment to education, food access, community safety and social context and our healthcare systems. Um, all of these factors contribute to health and well being for the mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditure, health status, and functional limitations of populations throughout this world. But we are talking about the United States today. So, to begin, um, people of a color in America live with more pollution than their white neighbors. Um, a 2021 study builds on a wealth of research that has shown that people of color in America live with more pollution than their white neighbors. That fine particulate air pollution matter known as PM 2.5 is harmful to human health. And many of you who I assume are joining us today are experts are very interested in environmental health. So you probably already know that. Um, but that particulate uh, matter is harmful to human health and responsible for 85,000 to 200,000 excess deaths in the United States annually. So let's now move to talk about, you know, the biggest pollution disparities. Um, so I think many of you know this, but Black people are exposed to a greater than average concentration of dangerous forms of pollution uh, known as PM 2.5. People of color face more exposure from almost every type of source while white people are less exposed. And as you see from the graphs below, um, those particulate matter factors include construction, power plants, other sources, industrial, residential, cars, trucks, and agriculture. And you know, as you look at the first graph, you see that the, you know, the rates of those exposures to black people are greatest. However, there are other people of color who have similar exposures 
But I think the contrast that we are talking about today is the difference between people of color, black people in particular, to the white population as a whole. Any comments or thoughts about what this slide is telling us? Is this what most of you are aware of? Or is this new information? Any comments? I, I can't really see, I, I can see me and <laughs> Jessica. And so I, I can't see everyone else. Um, but if, if anyone would like to unmute and give any comments on this slide, I'd. Um, again, I hope that this is a conversation more than me just speaking to you. This and is I, Debbie uh, Hall. Uh, yeah, definitely aware. Great, thank you, thank you, Debbie. And is this if your if your neighbors? I, I guess if you if there's multicolors living in one area, um, does that still play out, or is this just because of location of living and working? It's location. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, uh, this is uh, Vic Wilson. Uh, hi, Renee. This is great. But I think building on Karen's question, it, it would be interesting to see this. I, I bet even when we control for poverty and location, I bet Blacks and other people of color still have higher uh, exposures. But I don't know if you have those data. Um, I don't. As you can see, that this this slide is from a New York Times article um, uh -huh. published in April uh, published April twenty eighth, twenty twenty one, and then was further updated in um, September of the same year. Um, so, um, I don't know the answer to that question, but that would be interesting to note. Mm -hmm. um, I think I know that when we talk when I talk about these issues um, of pollutant of um, you know PM 2.5 in neighborhoods, um, it's neighbor it, it, it's looking at the geography and the percentage of black, brown, and other minority groups that live in an area. So um, you know, but the the assumption that those neighborhoods are comprised of people that are all at a particular poverty level is, I don't think, conclusive. So, but that would be interesting to further uh, you know under study. Um, so this next slide is really talking about things that I think that we already know that um, yeah, many of you are probably familiar with this EPA study that found that in all but four states in our country, non-whites face higher exposure than whites to PM 2.5 um, pollutant uh, matter, much of which come from the burning of fossil fuel. I think we all know this. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I will assume that everybody on this call, we already know this, um, and we know that we have a lot of work to do to improve that outcome. So, so let's talk about, you know, what this particulate matter does to our bodies on a day-to-day -day impact. Um, um, that pollution can cause shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, chest pain, and fatigue. Those fine particulates can also um, make conditions worse, and these specific conditions are cardiovascular disease and heart disease, asthma, and COPD. And then when we look at this from a ground level ozone impact, you, again, similar, difficulty breathing deeply, shortness of breath, sore throat, wheezing, coughing, and fatigue. And then we add this final layer of the ozone can make these conditions even worse. Um, for asthma and COPD and emphysema. So, so I guess when you start thinking about communities and you think about the greater exposures and then you start thinking about the health impacts, um, and these are factors that people don't directly control, right? They live in an environment. Any, anyone like to talk more about this slide? I'll go on to the next slide. So, um, you know, again, how these factors on a daily basis and how they impact our health. Um, you know, everyday exposure to hormone disrupting chemicals contribute to health epidemics like breast cancer and prostate cancer and obesity and diabetes, as well as infertility and learning disorders. And I, um, you know, I, again, I, you know, when, when you're studying this and you're looking at the data, you know, I, for me, it's, it's alarming. Um, but when you think that someone is living in an environment and they don't even know that they are 
at greater risk because of where they live. Although we know from the data that where you live affects how long you live. And so um, the fact that we're starting to talk more and more educate our communities about the environmental factors, um, I think is very critical to um, how we can advocate collectively. Um, any comments on you know, the disease burdens that you're seeing here? Um, I know many of you on uh, this webinar focus and, and study environmental health factors. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, I will move on. <laughs> so let's go to lead. <laughs> so uh, the, the EPA estimates that roughly 6.5 to 10 million homes and buildings have surface water lines that are at least partially made of lead. Um, and I know we are most familiar with what we have learned from Flint, Michigan, right? Um, but, you know, I don't think the average person on a daily basis is thinking about whether or not they are having exposures to lead through the water they're drinking because of the pipes um, that are um, in, built in the apartments or housing stock that they live in. Um, so when you start looking at that lead issue in particular, and see that 24 million housing units in the United States that have been that have deteriorated lead-based paint and elevated levels of lead contamination. More than four million of those homes to have at least one child age one to five years old. Um, and so this is where we start. Um, um, you know, a child can't advocate for themselves, right? Um, but um, and then when we look at the 2020 study that um, was conducted um, out of American University that found programs relying on customers to pay to have their lead pipe fully replaced put low income and African American households at a greater risk of lead exposure. Um, so as we look at the history, you know, before 1940, 87% of our houses, housing stock was, was built with lead-based paint. And then from 1940 to 1959, that decreased to 69%. And then between 1960 to 1977, it decreased even further to 24%. Um, but I, you know, I know that in Cincinnati, we have a lot of older housing stock. And so therefore we have people living in households where they are exposed to lead. Um, you know, Dr. Karen Baylor um, continues to do research and she leads a research team at American University examining equity issues as it relates to the replacement of pipes that have lead in them. And so um, in that study and in, in one of the studies that she co-authored, um, there was a striking differences between the neighborhoods and the patterns of lead pipe replacement. I think this might lead back to the other question that that um, we asked in that very opening slide, where we're you know trying to understand like what what does the makeup of a neighborhood look like, and what does that impact really on an individual basis? And so I think what this study is telling us is that while you, while there may be knowledge of uh, lead pipe in many communities, the ability to be able to remove those those lead pipes um, is disparate. Um, in the wealthiest areas, two thirds of households have fully replaced their lead pipes during ongoing infrastructure projects compared to only one quarter in areas with lowest median incomes, um, showing about a 2.3 to one ratio. And so then as we look at this lead issue and then look at the exposure and what that results in. So, you know, a mom who is pregnant, um, her birth rate of preterm birth is increased. Um, women who deliver a preterm have higher mean blood level lead levels. And, you know, when I look at this picture and, you know, it's like, you know, my heart just starts beating, right? Because, um, you know, when you think of, you know, a child coming into this world um, already facing a, a fat health factor, um, and that mom maybe not even understanding um, that she's living in an environment that gives her that greater exposure. Um, because any, you know, speaking as a mother, you know, you want to protect your child. And so just think of what you don't know from the environmental emittance and, and, and potentially what you're breathing in on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, to, to even 
look at this further, and I really would like to talk a little bit more about this particular slide. Um, you know, when you start thinking about um, the the exposure, right, of air pollution and how that then lead is not the only environmental exposure that may contribute to adverse birth outcomes. Air pollution and its components have been shown to increase the risks of lower birth weight and shorter gestation. So in this conceptual model of societal factors um, from discrimination to income inequality, to educational achievement gaps to residential segregation, um, this model is telling us that these social so societal factors in the United States lead to psychosocial stress and toxic environmental exposures and ultimately contribute to racial disparities in birth outcomes. So I know we, we see the data on infant mortality and maternal health outcomes. And so when you start thinking of some of the environmental toxins and exposures that create this predisposition, um, you know, for me, that's, um, it, it's a little scary, right? Because um, again, these are factors that people don't directly control and they potentially oftentimes don't even know that the exposure is there. Um, I, I would, you know, I, I think the question is how, how, is edu how do we educate and build greater awareness and understanding? But even with that understanding and awareness, I think my challenge for that is once you know what, what, what um, capacity do you have to have an impact on that environmental factor that you don't directly control? And I just would love to hear everyone's thoughts on that, what, what we can do, because obviously that got done by one person. How can we collectively advocate around these factors? Um, anyone have any thoughts? Or have you read any research that has shown some part of the country where there has been an ability to create greater knowledge and awareness and that led to advocacy that actually caused some action to take place to improve uh, those environmental exposures in um, communities that don't necessarily even know that they are living in environmental areas that have higher exposure. So Renee, this is Chuck. I think part of the problem is that we in this, in our society are responding instead of doing, right? So you look at Flint, Michigan, we responded, we didn't, we're not thinking thoroughly through what we should be doing and, and the cost of, of doing some of this is you know, outrageously expensive, but it has to be done. But I think a lot of times we're just reactionary rather than you know, really thinking through and, and, and how, the, how this impacts us in the future. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, from the MPH program perspective, I'm hoping our students understand that we provide them the tools that can help drive policy, but it's really an awareness, I think, of our community leaders and our local and state and national leaders as well. Thank you, Chad. I have, uh, I have read a few articles uh, last year uh, about heavy metals. And some of those articles really highlight, um, highlights the amount of, of these metals in general and, and the lead in the constructions, in areas, heavy areas, Cincinnati, Cleveland, in the old, old buildings, old areas. And uh, I did really uh, thorough research, you know, like search for the reasons and what can be done. And the papers address the problem actually, but if, if we know that the constructions, the old buildings, um, they have this high concentration of the lead um, and other metals, then why there will be no mass cleaning for those areas? But I, I do understand that also moving those people from their houses, you know, like what is the strategy, you know? How can, how can um, this poor um, populated area, you know, be reconstructed and then what to do with the people, how they can afford the new houses, you know, everything this expenses. So actually there is a, a lot of information outside to address the problems. And then um, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Charles 
uh, is from the APA, there was a lot of, of uh, information that all of these metals are going into the water. And then also now we have, uh, you know, pollution in the water. So I think, I think it needs a lot of, of effort from the leaders, from the high hurricane to, and, and, and budget money to do that um, for these areas. Um, you know, constructions, buildings, cleaning the areas, especially the old, old areas, the paints from old, old, old times. And I was in Cleveland a few years I spent the entire summer there for an assignment. And, you know, I got lost so many times where you can go to old areas. And I was like questioning myself, why this area even exists? It's like a ghost in the middle of the day. You know, nobody's there. So I believe that all these areas, they need, they need attention from, um, I don't know, well, what can I say, you know, governmental people, leadership, uh, and so on to, to do something to renovate maybe the areas, just populate it with, with, uh, with the people to, to make life in this area, you know, in these areas and so on. I mean, I know I talked a lot, but it was just like really an, an, an eye opening for me when I did that source for a purpose to, to write a mini grant actually to uh, about the public health and so on. So it, there is a lot of information, but there is there is a limited um, there is a limited uh, policies and actions that are promising to be in place in the near future. Let me put it this way. No, I um I completely you know I think both you and um, Professor Dorn both have articulated you know the fact that there the information exists and we know the factors, um, but there is not a similar level of focus on the preventative strategies, um, what the it's you know where the dollars and and how we get champions in policy makers to understand the, the long-term adverse impacts to the lifespan of populations of people um, that are living throughout you know not just this region of greater cincinnati but this country um, i you know when i think about the conversations of late and the prioritization of policy be you know yes we we know climate change is a a huge factor that we have to be focused on but some of the immediate um, factors that are contributing to poor health outcomes um, have to do with the air quality. And, um, you know, and some of that simple, you know, is there greater policy for when construction happens in areas that there's greater, um, where they're surrounded by neighborhoods, what, what are those policy factors? And so I, I'm not saying I have the solution, um, but I do think that the solution rests within these type of conversations so that we can um, begin to mobilize conversation so that we can then kind of build some strategies that we can collectively work towards advocating to policymakers on. I mean, there are many policymakers across the United States um, and in our own region um, who, who I, you know, I think would would be, you know, able to champion these issues when they start seeing the actual human impact. Um, I just don't think that there's enough of the connection of the things that we know are the factors contributing um, and, and what that means in quality and length of life. Um, I think we usually talk about these terms and these issues in like these big mi macro levels versus looking at micro strategies that we can collectively begin to articulate. Um, you know, I know when Flint, Michigan, and the, you know the whole country was focused on Flint, Michigan, right? Um, it's like you know that that can't be an outlier, <laughs> right? So um, you know, so where's the alarm going off across the country? You know, on you know, let's take a look at all of our major city or you know communities, and um, I know the dollar 
for this are going to be enormous. But if there isn't going to be advocacy to address these factors that we know have a direct contributor to so many factors in people's ability to have a healthy life. Um, um, and so, you know, um, I, we are, you know, one voice, um, but our one voice is not going to begin to peel away at the layers of policy that need to begin to focus in this space. So um, I, you know, I think, I think, we, we don't see the strategy. So I think, you know, for me, it's like, okay, what could we do beginning here um, to take the expertise of many of you, you know, on this webinar and really begin to focus on the fact, you know, the title of this um, presentation, the environmental factors that are contributing to the disparate outcomes for population of people. Um, I don't have the all the answers, but I, I, I I'm, you know, I, I hesitate to say this, but I am on an environmental committee with UC Health, but I, I really, with UC rather, um, I, I would like to see how we could begin to have some policy strategy conversations that we could have with policymakers um, to get them to better understand how these construct, how these various factors that happen every day in, in our communities are having an impact on the length of life of people. Can I add one more thing? Yes. Since we are in the, I think in the academics brain. So even we are talking about the necessity for discussion at the upper level, you know, governmental level, policies level, whatever you call it. But I think also there is a need for education, you know, start the education in the in the schools, even from the schools, in those areas, because again, we call we call them segregated areas, and in those segregated areas, this is where you can see, and I think this is why there is there is the statistic shows that there is a higher um, impact of pollution on on the black than white. And I don't think it's just just the color, but I think the segregation segregated areas is is a better reflection to the problem. Because if I live in that area, you know, I will be among the group, among the population affected by the what's going on with these houses, with the with the soil. So it's so important to start educating the kids from, from, from day one, enrichment activities and going up in the ladder to the middle schools, high school. So we have citizens that they are educated about their surroundings, about the environmental uh, pollution, around them, how they can avoid it, how they can, how they can get out of that situation and, and uh, you know, just, just help have hands to help each other while, you know, an outside, an outside policy is just also forming around uh, having a better quality of life for these areas, for those citizens. Because if you don't, if the kids are not aware, I mean, they say, okay, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just like a piece of, you know, of, of these rusted things and just they go and play and they are not aware. It's just what we build in the kids. They stay with them, I think, all their lives. It's just so hard to, to change that either belief, whatever you want to call it, or that foundation and, and, then it, become, it becomes harder. I would like to bring up a related issue since, since we are talking about um, how environmental factors are impact specific neighborhoods. I think this is also a really big problem with affordable housing. People aren't living in these areas because they necessarily want to, like, yes, it's probably also where their family is from, but it's also because this is what they can afford. And I don't think it's 
appropriate for the for the affordability to include lead in their pipes. <laughs> um, and so that that seems like it those two things should probably be connected in our minds when we're thinking about ways to address policymakers. No, that is so very true. I mean, um, in our community, in the city of Cincinnati in particular, we are the still the fifth most segregated city in America. So, um, so you're you're exactly right. The affordability factor um, creates. I, I don't want to say a pipeline, but it 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 it. Um, it doesn't give us a lot of great deal of hope because affordability is not being um, desegregated, right? Um, and um, so those those issues do need to be better connected. And I think that might be a way to draw together more um, advocates um, from two different areas to understand the overall impact on quality of life. Um, because I think that I think those two connections could elevate to a different um a, a broader focus um that ultimately gets to um you know even you know how kids are impacted but you're going to have to tie the environmental and affordable housing issues and so that they're not two separate issues um but understand that those two issues together um could changing those and improving those to the environmental factors and the affordable housing um accessibility could improve the dispersion of where people live and give greater opportunity to lessen the impact of the environmental impacts. Totally agree with that. Um, um, the pathway to that, I'm not sure, um, but I, you know, again, I think that it's these type of conversations that hopefully get us thinking a little differently um, and understanding how we need to, um, you know, think about more strategy than knowing that we have volumes of research that's, that inform and support what we know exists. Um, I'm gonna move on to kind of our last, my last few slides and then we can continue the conversation. Um, again, I think that because of who's on the line, I think you may know all of these factors. I'm, I'm focusing on lead um, because I think it's the, 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 the one factor that we are clear of understand lead, right? Um, and so, you know, again, we, we understand the harmful impacts and again, back to, you know, where people are living and, and what those exposures are. And, you know, so when I, so when I, you know, put this slide in, in this presentation, you know, I immediately thought about like, when you think of young children and the, the vulnerability to their nervous systems from lead exposure um, and, and how they are then in a greater absorption four times that of adults um, from that lead exposure, which impact their intellectual disability, um, underperformance at schools and behavioral issues. And so, you know, when I think about what, what I hear from the work that we are doing in the schools and then, you know, what educators talk about when we talk and you hear about behavioral issues and you hear about, um, you know, whether, you know, the, the, the growth um, in their performance, in their academic learning. I don't know that anyone's really directly tying potentially the environments in which a child lives, having just as much impact on, uh, you know, to their, their ability to, to come in and be able to best perform. Um, you know, that's so, that's so scary because that's something unseen, right? A parent doesn't even understand that factor. And then Oftentimes it results in medication um, versus understanding that there might be some environmental exposures um, similar to adults. And then, you know, ultimately we think about pregnant women and we look at the infant mortality rates. And I, I don't, I'm sure that there's data that shows this, but it'd be interesting to look at where people are living, um, what those infant mortality rates look like in those particular neighborhoods um, and, 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 and draw some conclusions or, you know, do some greater research to, really about back to where people are living, whether, you know, in, 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 in the affordable housing um, placement of, of affordable housing in our community and whether or not we're seeing some results um, or impacts based upon where you live um, for a pregnant mom and what that infant mortality index looks like. That'd be interesting for me to see, for us to see and then, and, frankly, then maybe be able to build a bigger case for why we have to have affordable housing availability across our region um, so that people aren't limited to where they live and then, then 
putting themselves and their families in the greater risk. And these are all my opinions, <laughs> um, but what this slide is showing us and it, who, it's to, who, who put this slide together was the World Health Organization. And, and the bottom line to this slide is there is no safe level of lead exposure. I think that's the bottom line to the slide. Um, and then finally, you know, there are three broad reasons that um, health disparities may exist. Uh, we've talked about a lot of them, but you know, just as I close, um, groups may face greater exposure to pollution because of factors ranging from racism to class bias to housing market dynamics and land cost. And, and some examples of that include pollution sources tend to be located near disadvantaged communities, um, increasing exposure to harmful pollutants. And again, we've talked about that a great deal today. Um, second, low social position may make some groups more susceptible to health threats because of factors related to their disadvantage. Um, and I know that we have had conversation, I've had conversations with some of you that are joining today on the access to health care, not necessarily just access to health care, but you know, whether or not there is enough health benefit to cover all need. Um, when we think of grocery stores and living in food deserts or having limited access to healthy foods or having transportation barriers to get to grocery stores um, and be able to buy um, in a way that you could buy um, a, an amount on a budget that then you would be able to prepare healthier, but just how you get to that location. If you're a senior, if you're a mom with children and those barriers, um, um, you know, then we talk about, you know, the um, conditions in which um, people work and the access to job opportunities. Again, transportation being a barrier. Um, higher traffic exposures in many of the areas, uh, again, where um, we're seeing these higher levels of environmental factors that are increasing the risk and harm on one's health. And then finally, existing health condition behaviors or traits may predispose some groups to greater risk. Um, um, again, you know, I, I took a lot from the World Health Organization because this issue is, you know, a, a world issue, but, um, you know, in the United States, um, I think we're, we're seeing even greater impacts. Um, so reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases through better transit, um, food and energy use choices can result in improved health and, and then particularly through reduced air pollution. And I think those are the things that we've talked about today. Um, you know, as I quote in closing, you know, disparities in health will not be eliminated until the conditions of our communities are significantly improved. Um, unequal treatment statement was made in 2002 and we're in 2022. And I, I can't say that a lot has changed, but I think we know a lot more. Um, and, and, I, and I think someone um, commented, our kids understanding, um, you know, I think we have to look at the broader continuum um, from children to adults to policymakers. So there's not one lever that's going to solve this issue, but it's going to be a collective strategy where we are looking at policy. We are working with policymakers. We are working to educate children, educate families, and, and inform policies that um, improve um, how construction um, policies impact those who are constructing, um, how um, we look at the segregation of our community and how we look at the dispersion and development of affordable housing that gives options for people to be able to live in safer environments. And so those are a lot of factors, but I know that um, collectively we have a better chance of moving the needle. So I thank you so much for the opportunity um, to, for, for, to have this conversation with you and I look forward to our next steps. Thank Hi, Ms. Harris. This is Danny McBride. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I think Closing the Health Gap is such a wonderful organization and the opportunity for the ERC to host you today, um, I think is such a great opportunity for our department and all the people represented on this call who want to make a difference in this area. Um, so thank you so much. Um, as I, so I'm young in my career. And as I think about how I can make a difference in the community, I think in community health and environmental health, I think I feel a little bit jaded because when I think about the reasons why these health disparities exist, um, Cincinnati is a great example of 
you know, historical segregation, why black neighborhoods were moved to where they were based on, you know, highway construction and different things that have exacerbated, um, you know, air pollution in communities, black neighborhoods specifically. Um, and I think about, you know, how money and government has played a, a role in that um, and how, um, you know, the way that money talks isn't always thinking about what's best for people when thinking about profits. And so um, I'm trying to contemplate as I move forward in my career, what's really the best approach? Um, I think it has to be multifaceted with policy, of course, but um, just as I'm observing what's going around, what's going on in the world, it seems like, um, working with the community from the beginning is really such the best way to go. Like I see um, community activists in Southside Chicago who protested um, a metal scrapper facility coming to their community. And because of the collective actions of that community, you know, they were able to stop that. And so I just struggle with wanting to go into a marginalized community as a researcher and say, hey, did you know, like you're being exposed to all of these environmental concerns that are creating all these health issues um, that may affect you and there's nothing really we can do about it. Um, and so I'd love to hear just like um, your response or others on how like the academic, the community and policymakers can work together without strategically in a way where we can use all of those avenues um, for like an operation of good rather than what I've seen, you know, in some ways government or money working to exacerbate these issues. Well, um, thank you for, um, well, thank you for your contemplation and continued focus in this space of environmental um, um, health and disparities. Um, I, I guess I, I want to give an example of where, when, when residents were activated in understanding how um, particulate matter from a gun range in Lincoln Heights um, potentially could and may have had an impact on auditory as well as um, um, the mental health of residents, as well as the physical health of residents. Um, so, you know, um, working with, um, and, I, and I, I apologize if I say this wrong, but a division somewhere in UC um, who came, a group of, uh, um, and I just can't remember what department, um, but they came out and they trained residents on how to do soil samples. And then they were able to understand, um, you know, what those soil sam samples resulted in understanding about the soil and the impacts of um, that gun range on the soil surrounding those uh, residential units that were, you know, in, in, in a very short proximity um, to where people live every day and have for 80 years that that, um, um, facility was there and now because of all of first of the residents becoming more knowledgeable and able to speak about and advocate that coupled with other environmental organizations that understood those factors as well as policymakers with Senator Sherrod Brown and Senator Portman and other policymakers in and around that community um, that site is soon to move I, I, I can't say that I know the specifics of that but They've done all of the, it's taken a while, probably longer than anyone thought, but because residents became involved and were able to advocate for themselves and understand the environmental impacts. Um, so I guess back to your point, I do believe it is a collective effort, but I, I do think that for us to actually be able to have an impact on some of the factors that we've described today in the presentation and discuss, we're gonna have to focus on potentially one neighborhood and do and create environmental, you know, I think about our do right ambassadors around health and that sort of thing. Like we create these environmental ambassadors, or environmental advocates at a neighborhood level and people are trained to understand. And so then they can speak and tell their own story through be it photo voice or some other qualitative way to describe the impact. I think that coupled with the academic expertise coupled with policymakers, I think that's how we're gonna be able to, I think, focus and be able to show the outcome, 
have people who are impacted be able to, to describe the impact in their house. I think it's those kind of strategies. And, um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, you know, um, I know we, you know, in time have focused on disparities um, around food access, but I think we don't talk enough and we haven't demonstrated how we educate and equip the community with the tools to advocate and understand the environmental impacts. Um, so I think that's an immediate opportunity. Um, so I, you know, definitely would love to talk more about that with whoever would like. Um, um, but anyway, I'm going to stop talking. I'd those are great examples. Thank you so much. And that's very encouraging to hear you give those examples of ways communities can be empowered and work collaboratively with both um, academics and policymakers. Thank you. You're welcome. I. I... I want to share a personal story about this slid. So I was living in Indiana during my study in the dorms, University, uh, Indiana State University. And then uh, as a student, uh, I had my son and then uh, they requested, you know, who they, this is the, the clinic requested uh, tests for him. And then one of those were the lid. And then I received a letter that his level was really, really high. And I was just like, you know, in shock. I said, why? He's just like, you know, the doors are not, not the doors. They were apartments for married people, actually. And those were one of the best. And I said, why? But it turned that it's a wrong letter. And I received, you know, after I went and investigated and no, this can be, you know, can I repeat the, the test? Because this is, is impossible. I did not have any thing that will lead to a high concentration of lead in my children's in body. And then what happened is um, I received this letter to correct that, oh, you, you know, the test was wrong. You were not the a proper person to receive that letter and we repeated that. But uh, along all of that, there was no support to, to a person who received such a result, like, you know, high lead. There was nothing, they said, we cannot do anything. So imagine that if you have somebody who is not educated and somebody in the, um, you know, in the, in the poor areas and, do not know what to do, and then they have all these children. I think uh, some action has to be at um, at an upper level, and the clinic which did the test was, uh, you know, one of the the services, you know, for for um, limited income people. So there should be something also not just to educate the people to uh, to to advocate for themselves but in those centers that they are serving those uh, people with limited income you know affordability of this housing and so on will be the is the big issue for uh, such population to to move from uh, this pop, you know polluted areas so I thought that I want to share this, and I will. I, I never, uh, you know, will forget the, that that letter, and the no action. I was just like in shock. So, thank you for share, sharing that. And, and again, you're 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 you know further you know, exposing another gap. Um, and um, I'd be, before I move forward, I, I do want to um, thank Professor Dorn, who is also a member of Closing the Health Gaps Board. Um, for his leadership and the students that have worked with us here through the MPH program at the Center for Closing Health Gaps. I, I wanted to make sure I did that. Um, well, it's a pleasure. You know, it's, it's, it's your, you know, what you guys are doing is really impactful for our community. I know there's, uh, you focus on particular groups, but I think the entire community benefits from, from that, from the work that the center does. So Thank you. thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, are there other questions or comments? Um, you know, I I, I, um, I I really appreciate having the opportunity to have the conversation, but 
Um, I'm for anyone that knows me, I'm a person of action. <laughs> and so um, I, I feel, you know, that there would be, it'd be great to at least come out of this conversation. And I know um, uh, Dr. Newman, I don't know if he's on, but uh, with the CG, um, you know, I just know that um, it, it, it would be really great if we could just come up with one demonstration project that we could do that could at least help. I mean, and again, I think Lincoln Heights is a great example um, that the, the gun range in Lincoln Heights and how, you know, um, from environmental, from the environmental department at UC, you know, um, um, there was someone from the auditory side. And so, so it was interesting just to see different aspects of UC come together to support and help inform and educate and empower the residents of Lincoln Heights. Um, and, you know, I think maybe that was a bigger example because it was like something that impacts so many people and, and happened to involve the city of Cincinnati and other municipalities that utilize that space and, and other departments of the federal government that utilize that space. So it, maybe it was a unique opportunity, but that's probably like a bigger example, but I think there's some smaller examples that um, a small example might help help people better understand this longer term impact that has um, um, impacted the lives and continues to impact the lives. And I, and, I, and I think we keep hearing this conversation back to housing um, and environmental impacts and affordable housing. And, and I do, I, I really believe that there's a tie there um, that could lead to a, a smaller victory maybe that then could create people better understanding the connection because I don't know that people think of the connection at this point. I really don't. I don't feel that that's a conversation that happens. I was going to add just real quickly, there there was a story, I, I don't remember if it was yesterday or day before, that uh, Rumkey was trying to expand one of its dump sites, uh, which is not necessarily uh, filled with lead, but it does have a problem with, you know, the healthy communities in the sense of the smell and so forth. And if I use the the the, uh, the Rumpke dump that's out there on the way to Miami University, um, I think it's right, 20, US 27. When they first put it out there, there was nobody out there except farms. And now, of course, uh, you know we have urban sprawl. It that's first example. Second example is the Seagram's plant out in um, um, Lawrenceburg. Uh, when it was first put put out there over 100 years ago, they burned barrels uh, for to process for the developing and making of whiskey. And so now there's this, I don't know if it's mold specifically aspergillus mold, but it comes out of, of the burn. And so you get things coated with this mold. Well, now there are neighborhoods that want the plant to move, right? They want the rumpke to move. They want you know these, these factories that have been abandoned for years to be torn down and moved. And, and that's all well and good, but the, the, the situation comes back to as a state, the state of Ohio or, or as a nation, you have to begin to think about, do we put that into a contract when somebody decides to build something? And I'll use the example in the book, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. He talks about how societies around the world decided they chose. I mean, they didn't sit down at a coffee table and say, yeah, let's go ahead and destroy our community. They didn't think about it. And so you use the example he used in the book was, I think it's a mine out in, um, it's either Utah or in Idaho. It's a strip mine where they're uh, taking um, material, raw material out of the ground and poisoning the water. And up until about, I think it was Arco, and up until about the maybe mid seventies, no one really cared or monitored that. Today, of course, we do a lot more monitoring. So if you think about it as a company, and we think that the largest factory that's gonna be built in Ohio is this one that's outside of Columbus for developing chips. So we would assume that they would do an environmental study of the ground before, they would monitor the ground after and constantly be monitoring the development of the factory, but also once it's in place. Now, all that said means it's more money, more people, more opportunities for us to do research, uh, which is important for our students, but it's also important for us to get that data to help us then go back after the companies, like they tore this big um, smokestack down last summer and it fell in the river, uh, down along the Ohio River, uh, not thinking about what that might do to the environment itself. So, so some of it comes to our belief systems as how do we 
create opportunities for companies to come to Ohio, but also hold them responsible for the outcomes of their work, th not thinking that they're going to be responsible because we assume they are, but we sort of have to hold our hold their feet to the fire as well. That's more of a, I guess, editorial than anything else. Well, thank you. I um, did anyone? Uh, I know our time is coming to a close here, but. Um... Are there any other comments about uh, today's uh, discussion and uh, webinar um, that anyone would like to share or questions? There were um, a couple questions in the chat about lead. Um, we have time. So the first one was, are there more exposures in Cincinnati to lead from lead in water or lead in paint? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think it's more paint. I think it's more paint. Oh, I was, I was, I was, I was gonna, I was gonna say that I think it's more paint. Um, and and a couple, maybe a decade ago, there was a, and maybe it's a little bit more than the decade. I'm losing track of years. There was a very very heightened focus on the remediation of lead paint from buildings um, in Cincinnati. And I, you know, I, I think that that might have been a, a very large federal grant. Um, but obviously the problem hasn't gone away. So, um, and, and, and I remember asking myself like, hey, like I wonder what happened after the dollars went away? Um, like, what's the focus on that issue? Um, so, um, you know, I, I think the affordable housing conversation um, and, you know, lead paint might be the best, the easiest start um, looking at our housing stock um looking you know it'd be very easy to map um where people are living right and the conditions of the buildings um or how you know the age of the buildings because the age of the buildings will tell you you know whether or not potentially is lead paint is is um inside of that building um and so that might be a good starting point so that we better understand where the problem is greatest and how we get some champions to focus on getting federal resources to continue the remediation um, versus have, you know, because, you know, a, a lot of, a, a large percentage of people probably residing in those properties are rental. Doesn't mean that it's all rental, um, but I would imagine a large percentage is rental. Was someone gonna say something or add? No? Okay. Um, any, oh, were there any other questions, Jessica? Um, yes, let me scroll back up. Um, would you know if there's any specific recommendation uh, regarding lead flushing in summer months? And is there an optimal regimen for lead flushing? Um, I do not know the answer to that question. Uh, does anyone on this webinar know the answer to that question? So it was a question about lead flushing in the summer versus doing it at a different time of year, uh, assuming that it emits more in the summer. I, I, I'm not sure that, is that, I see I Miss Wilson shaking her head. That's okay, no, thank you. <laughs> I was like, this is not my area of expertise, <laughs> but that seems like that would be the case. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I guess the point would be, you would want to maybe prohibit that work happening in the summer. Um, is that the thought and asking that question? Whoever asked the question? I don't, lead does not emit, but okay. it does not emit, it is not a radioactive uh, material to emit, you know, anything, but I think it's just, uh, the humans' activity in the summer are more diverse, where you have paint, renovations, and constructions, and other things, and then you have flushing and water and everything. So I think, I think, you know, that is the reason for the increase, you know, lead, if, if it goes into the water or flowing or something but so the, the, the I, particulates I, don't go into the air when someone say somebody is you know taking down it is from from our activities you know like if you if you do something that you know those particles 
they will go by uh, but if you have just this piece you know on the on the counter it will you know it will not emit anything unless you do some fine activities you know because because this is drilling you know when you drill you have all these go in the air not right. particles right yeah uh, you know the particles or yeah. you know as aerosols that they go to the air so uh, i used the wrong word of emit so it was really more the particulates and and the fact that in the summer people yes. are active and outside, so yeah. I should have used that word instead. So no, thank you for that. I I know we're at time, um, and I am just really grateful for the opportunity to share um, my thoughts um, on um, you know the environmental factors and impact on health disparities. But I look forward to continuing to work with um, um, anyone that would like to further focus on you know how we address the disparities as it relates to environmental factors so jessica thank you for um helping make this happen and thank you all for participating today thank you for this talk it, it was really interesting i appreciate it thank you jessica yes thank you everyone for attending um i'll send out the recording and the evaluation link and thank you so much for your time today renee oh, thank, thank you so you. much Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.